Now we have this sort of centralized controlling mechanism and that allows for what well, some people believe unlimited government printing of money so there's no competition and this is a negative on gold and crypto. But history says it's only temporary because these mechanisms of gold and silver, it's really global, it's decentralized and it will all of a sudden spring up in value. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Frank Holmes, the CEO of and Chief Investment Officer of U.S. Global Investments. Frank, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be with you, Elijah. Definitely, it's great to be with you. And kind of a big announcement uh, for actually Hive Blockchain, uh, one of the ETFs you have. It's going on the NASDAQ, and by this time the interview is going to be posted on Friday, it will be on the NASDAQ exchange, so that's very exciting. We're very excited about it. Definitely, definitely. Now, I really wanted to kind of talk about the macro factors in the economy and also monetary and fiscal policy, because there's a lot of things that have been changing over the last few years that, in your view, are going to impact both gold and cryptocurrencies, and cryptocurrencies go along specifically with Hive blockchain itself. So can you kind of walk us through these macro factors that are changing? Well, as you know, in all of our prospectuses, we have a, a, our investment sort of philosophy. And like I see, you have Thomas Aquinas, uh, the great theologian philosopher. Um, and he used a lot of his view of the world through Aristotelian logic. And uh, and so I like, I like to start thinking of the big picture of macro forces, and usually it's a binomial model like zeros and ones, which you code with. It's either a monetary policy or a fiscal policy. And the monetary policy bifurcates again into either it's money printing or it's real cost of interest rates. So you would, would the government pay you to buy their government bond minus a CPI number, and are you making or losing on a real rate of return? So th those monetary factors are really important for moving a country's currency, economic development. Fiscal policy, which is basically controlled by the president and Congress, and the Senate has to approve what is basically pushed through. Fiscal policy is a binomial model. It is taxes and regulations, and regulations are a form of taxation. So are they going to raise taxes or are they going to drop taxes? Are they gonna raise regulations or drop regulations? Has an important factor, a multiplying effect in economic growth and prosperity. The same thing, when we go to monetary policy, there's a cost of money. Is it, can I get money? Can I get a cheap 15 year mortgage? Can I afford that? So we have these trade-offs and that's how we look at the world and we compare the G7 countries, how they're comparing their monetary and fiscal policies, and the G20. So when we go to the G20, we're now including Russia and China uh, in the G20. When you're in the G7, they're not part of that picture. Uh, it is the biggest economic blocks, which happen to be the EU, the US, and Japan, uh, and Germany. Uh, they're the, the four biggest power blocks, uh, but the EU includes Germany. So in your view, as we see this like expansion of government and greater taxation and regulation, why is that then bullish for alternative currencies such as gold and cryptocurrencies? Well, historically, when there's a big imbalance between fiscal and monetary policies, gold goes up. It, it, it's like the dagger board in your sailboat. Uh, your your balance. It's basically it needs something. The bigger the sailboat, the deeper it has to be in the water so it doesn't tip over. You need that sort of core to it. And and I think that um, we're seeing the, the switch in that monetary and fiscal policy uh, under this new administration. And the administration is very similar to what took place under Obama's administration. And that's what the EU was this sort of synchronized tax and regulation which they like to call harm harmony. But really, when you look underneath it, it's to increase taxes and increase regulations uh, because it creates a stronger centralized government and a more sort of a socialistic business model. And the EU is definitely influenced 
a, a lot in the U.S. and in the policies this way. The real radical uh, going back over the past 50 years was a, a Ronald Reagan was a big radical in that. Uh, and strangely enough, so was President Clinton. Cl President Clinton was a radical. Uh, and the media uh, don't like him uh, as much as they don't like Trump, you know, another radical. Uh, and Trump clearly was, you know, cut tr the red tape and regulation, uh, lower corporate taxes, lower uh, any form that they could with taxation to keep the economy going. And you'll be able to get the tax revenue from the growth and prosperity of growth. Uh, and C President Clinton, uh, even though both are one Republican, one Democrat, he was a radical because he streamlined welfare. Uh, he streamlined regulations. Uh, he dropped uh, uh, taxation. Uh, he unleashed um, uh, telecommunications, uh, which was being strangled with regulations. He unleashed the internet, uh, which we're using today as, as, it, as it's evolved. So when you deregulate and you, you create more competition and you create more innovation, when you do the opposite, that is you increase regulations, you stifle innovation, you stifle competition. And the only real competition is between the political talking heads between political party, not technology. Uh, and I think it also has a big impact on private property rights. Uh, that if you see where the greatest innovation in energy and technology is where you have private property rights. In Mexico, you don't, you don't, if you own resources, they're not yours, they're governments. Uh, so they never evolved. Whereas fracking, the idea of technology and the oil and gas industry took place here in Texas and in other states because people own their own land and they wanted to make sure. And, and the guys that I know that are the, the biggest in this business, they're very caught up with the environment because they have plants and animals everywhere and they want to make it sustainable, but they're also about innovation uh, to be able to do fracking. So you don't see this in France. You don't see this in, in, in uh, most of uh, uh, Europe uh, because it's a civil law. It's a complete different concept. So I think that what's happening today is under Janet Yellen is just sort of going back to this global synchronized taxation and regulation. And we just saw that with the G7 countries coming together like an OPEC cartel with minimum taxation on corporations between the countries to stop countries from going, companies going from one country to the next. And, and this is really flawed because Texas, San Antonio was able to get Toyota to build a plant here because of tax benefits. Uh, it, it, Deng Xiaoping, the revolution in China was because he created seven ports with tax-free zones. Uh, the big breakthrough in the EU being formed and the nations all of a sudden coming together and with under one currency, really the pinch of the landing place was Ireland. And Ireland has these, these tax-free zones. So they are able to usher in. Now we have this sort of centralized controlling mechanism and that allows for, well, some people believe, unlimited government printing of money so there's no competition and this is a negative on gold and crypto. But history says it's only temporary because these mechanisms of gold and silver, it's really global, it's decentralized, and it will all of a sudden spring up in value. In mentioning that springing up in value, you've, your forecast in the past for gold has been about $4,000 an ounce. Is that still your forecast today? It is. It is. You know, I, I think that the great buy right now is get a mortgage. I mean, it's ridiculous. I've been writing about this. The last time I was sitting on your program, uh, I talked about this fake CPI number. It's not real. If you use the CPI number, the, the algorithm that was used in 1980 when gold hit, when inflation hit 20 percent and when uh, gold hit uh, 850 and we had a complete in silver $50 an ounce, um, that algorithm today if it was being used. Inflation is 12 percent. It's 12 percent. Why? Because the government's over time taken out energy, taken out the price of, of the cost of food. Well, I've seen my food costs go up double digit. I was just drove to L.A. with the Grand Canyon with my family on a road trip. And then we went to L.A. Is Why would California be a dollar more a gallon of gas? A dollar more. So the state income tax is 13 percent. Everything costs more. And, and, and basically businesses are all bolting out of there, going to Texas. Uh, Elon Musk is coming to Texas. They're going to Florida, the hedge fund, because of strangulation by regulation and taxation. 
So you're asking yourself, you know, so what are you getting besides nice weather in California? Uh, if, if, if so, you will see money goes around. It goes where there's better monetary and fiscal policies, and the state also has better can have better monetary and fiscal policies. And with respect to investing in gold, I know there are different a lot of different options for people to consider. You know, they can have the physical metal, and that that's really good for like insurance. You know, against crisis. There's also if if we are going to see an increase in the value of the price of gold. Often the mining stocks give a lot of leverage to that. They rise more than the price of gold. Um, so your perspective on that, and I know also you run a Go AU, an, a gold e mining ETF. So that kind of gives people kind of a basket of mining stocks instead of just counting on one company to perform. Well, I try to embed in that a, a mathematical quant discipline every quarter recalibrating. And it only basically looks at those companies which are showing on a relative basis the strongest growth in revenue, the least expensive to buy on a cash flow to EBITDA basis, free cash flow yields, high gross margins. Uh, in, in my 40 some odd years now of investing and, and lots of experience in the creation of royalty companies, my first uh, as an investment banker in my Canadian days, you know, that was uh, fascinating because Franco Nevada was the first company I got to work on to go public. Uh, going from a research analyst into investment banking, that was a fascinating journey of learning new things. And, and Franco Nevada today has $23 million, $24 million of, re of revenue per employee. Why would I, you know, I'd rather own that than I would Barrick or Newmont because they have $600,000 of revenue per employee. And they have the royalties on their assets in Nevada. So I'd rather own a royalty company. Um, and that also led me to get into crypto mining because you can get high revenue per, per employee. But coming back on this monetary fiscal policy, borrow if you can borrow cheap money right now. I, I, I think that the CPI number they're saying is going to be 4% inflation, and I can turn around and borrow for 3% for 15 years. And I think that if I had the other algorithm saying inflation is at 12%, it's cheap money. Why? That's why real assets have been on a tear. Used cars are up 25%. Housing's up. Uh, uh, the only thing that's gone down are cities like uh uh, New York City, uh, where condos have gone down, but property, real estate, et cetera, has gone up because of all this money printing. Uh, and I think what happens is that governments are smarter and they'll turn around and try to find ways that some people call it oppressive, like Gata calls it oppressive behavior by governments to get the price of gold down. We've had spoofing. We've had people go to prison now for spoofing on the price of gold, uh, manipulating the price down the futures market. So I, I think that they can never do it Long term, Eliza, it's important. Short term, it can be painful. Usually it's a great buy. And I think that Go AU is the ETF we created, and we did 8,000 hours of back testing and trying to find out where are the best factors. And we launched it, and it has outperformed since it's launched the other gold equity ETFs and the other gold mutual funds. Uh, short term, it may not, but over rolling 12 month periods, it's been a phenomenal performer. And I think on the upside, when gold, like this time last year, when gold had the big rally, it was it was up spectacular. From its lows, I think it surged almost 100%. So I'd rather own something like that, such as GoAU, uh, as, a, as a product. Uh, and the other big phenomenon that's happened to us in the ETF space has been JETS, the JETS ETF. Business travel hasn't taken place to the degree because of concerns, because everyone's Zooming it now. But when 80% of the people get double vaccinated, business travel will come back again because you need it for big transactions. But what's happening is, is tourism is booming, absolutely booming. I saw this going to the Grand Canyon. Uh, I went to Vegas on my path for one night, staying there, then went down to LA. Booming, booming, booming. And the airlines themselves have repositioned. Southwest is flying from Phoenix down to Cobbles. The small cities in, in, in Pennsylvania, in Indiana, in Illinois, are flying to get south, get to the warmer weather, get to the state of Texas, get to Florida. The governors in these two states have been real thought leaders in dealing with COVID. They're much further ahead and people want some sunshine. They want vitamin D naturally. So we've seen new airlines come and go public. Very successful. The guy that started in Canada, a WestJet, that then went on to start JetBlue, he came up with a new airline this year called Breeze. It's a huge home run. Frontier went public. So the airlines ETF this time last year goes basically from 40 million in assets to 4 billion. 
Buffett dumps on them. And we know from data, which is no longer public because they stopped providing it in August of last year, but Robinhood, 25,000 millennial Robinhooders bought the Jets ETF like around $12. It went to 28. And then it corrects here to 20, under 26. I think we're getting for the next big wave as Europe opens up and, and uh, hopefully Canada gets us act together and opens up. But the real you know, tr uh, headwind has always been socialistic leaning governments have been the most severe in the lockdowns. States with more left governors, longer the lockdowns. Uh, this whole idea of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, you've seen state leadership like you've seen in Florida and in Texas have been very, very healthy and have led the boom. And so we are seeing the, a lot of tourism come to our states. And I think that's such a good point. And mentioning the Jets ETF, I mean, one of the things is that, yeah, more and more people are traveling as things are being, op being opened up, right? And people are getting vaccinated. Now, the interesting thing is, yeah, like you mentioned, for bigger transactions, like you, you can't you can't substitute the face-to-face -face interactions, right? That is something that is going to be here forever. I mean, at least that's my opinion. You know, you have to have face-to-face, -face, and that would just put more demand um, on on airlines and stuff. So can you, I guess, expand on how the Jet ETF kind of takes advantage of that increase in demand for flight travel? Well, it's a unique product. Once again, very quant mathematically driven. It recalibrates every quarter. The four big airlines, United, Delta, American, and Southwest. They're 10% each. Why? 40% of the portfolio are four big liquid names, but they represent 65% of all travel in America. Now, during the bottom of the crisis last year, uh, we went from TSA, we started reporting this time last year, how many people they cleared every day. And they went from 2.7 million people a day so 2 million Americans were flying back and forth across America every day. TSA would pre-clear them. And 700,000 were coming from Latin America, Europe, and Asia, inbound into America. So the number was about 2.7 million people cleared a day. That fell down to 90,000 in April, mid-April. Tax time, April the 15th, was almost the, the drop date of the lowest number of people flying in America. Recently, it surged back to over 1.8 million. So that, and business travel is not back to where it was. And global travel is not back to where it was. So I think there's much more upside in the global travel. Jets ETF is dominated by North American airlines and, and companies like Boeing will show up if it meets the quant model. Boeing's been in and out. Uh, and when we start to go globally, we have smaller positions in global airlines and airports. So all the airports in America are owned by cities. It's a very big source of revenue for municipalities. But when you go to Mexico, the several of them are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And in Canada, they're owned by private equity. Uh, Beijing is public, uh, Singapore, uh, Turkey, uh, Paris, De Gaulle Airport, it's public. So you can buy these airports and they have very stable sources of revenue and they can contract the number of workers they have. Uh, and what's interesting is that the governments did learn, don't lay off all the airlines people because the onboarding, if they go to unemployment and they're gonna come back to be employed, the onboarding's very expensive and takes a long time period. So they basically, the government said, we're gonna give you 25 billion directly, keep them in training. So they all are ready to fly an airplane. Uh, the stewardesses are ready to take care of you as soon as this economy turns. No lagging. Very important, no lagging. So I think governments have done a great job there in protecting that, that the workers are there, that they're ready and uh, able to fly. So the JETS ETF has a composition that as you go global, it has 50 basis points holdings. It also has uh, bookings.com. It has... Uh, it has uh, other public companies that, that allow you to be able to book your flights. Uh, they, they're very, very uh, dynamic at how they're able to manage the revenue and cash flow. They're the biggest advertisers on Google for travel. Uh, and when the, the, the COVID crisis hit, they could just cut, cut their marketing. So they actually survived and now all of a sudden they're thriving again. So I remain very bullish on the jets. We've listed also in Mexico City for Latin America and we just listed in London, England. 
So Jets is really becoming a global brand. Now, back on the topic of kind of the macro factors that are influencing, you know, gold and cryptocurrencies to go higher, your perspective then, I'd love to touch on the Hive uh, blockchain. One, yeah, exactly. The, the hat right there. Now, it's so interesting because when people think of investing in cryptocurrencies, they think of investing in Bitcoin, Ethereum. Those are kind of the main two. Uh, but they don't think of there's actually a company that mines Bitcoin. And one of also the um, the criticisms of cryptocurrency, it uses so much energy to mine. But Hive blockchain actually uses green energy. And now they're expanding into Sweden with a new uh, source of green energy. So kind of why would someone want to invest in a mining company that actually mines cryptocurrency? And also, do you want to share kind of how Hive blockchain is different because it uses green energy? Well, first of all, Hive, I was trying to launch a Bitcoin ETF after launching Jets. And I recognized that there's no way the SEC on their fears of anti-money laundering laws, even though the drug trade and so much as paper money, you know, that it's there, crypto seems to get that everything's bad about it, but it's just it's just not actual uh, actual uh, threat. Uh, there are bad people that want and use it, and now they can track them. Just like recently, the people they were able to track uh, with Bitcoin, uh, it is trackable. You just don't know who is it between, but unless they make a mistake in the process, but you do know where that cryptocurrency's been, and you know it's been into a dark cloud where they deal in in nefarious activities. Uh, so there, the software is there. But coming back on Hive, you know, I realized that when the CEO of Fidelity, a trillion dollar empire, uh, does not speak at investment conferences, but speaks at a crypto conference, and they've been doing their own Bitcoin mining, something big is happening, and blockchain technology is a transparent, it, it, is, a, it is very significant like the 14th century when accounting double entry was created. This allowed for financial banking and institutions to be created because of a basic accounting standard. There's been nothing since then. And, and, and blockchain is allows this transparency, which is so important. And that's why Fidelity started getting involved with Bitcoin mining. And they also know that the crisis of 08, 09 had all those, all those credit default swaps and mortgages been on, on, on a blockchain they, the Federal Reserve could have written a check for $8 billion and stopped the Lehman crisis. The global event wouldn't have taken place because they could see exactly who had what where. Uh, and so it's happening. And when I traveled around the world five years ago, it, it, crypto events were much bigger than any investment conference, much bigger than, than the money show in Orlando. Uh, just two or three weeks ago in Miami, 12,000 people paid $600 a person to show up at this event. I mean, it was unbelievable. And it was 15 minutes away from the hotel. It wasn't convenient in any way, but people paid. So something big has been happening in the digital world. And that's what I was trying to be a thought leader and be early in creating a product. So I realized I couldn't launch an ETF. Friends of mine called me, they didn't believe it was real, but they thought it was interesting because it was faddish in 2017. So I put up the institutional money that was needed and I went on as a chairman and launched high blockchain. And I was, because of being in the investment world, I knew that we needed to have an ESG strategy uh, and we had to be green only. And that's what we launched. So we became the first crypto mining company in the world. And it was pure green. First of all, it was in Iceland, geothermal. Then we went into Sweden. And now in the past 12 months, we've bought, purchased a facility in Quebec and now New Brunswick. And we own our own data center in New Brunswick, 50 megawatts going to 70 megawatts of energy. Um, and it's only green and we mine. So what happens in Bitcoin is every 10 minutes, it's a jump ball basically, or a drop hockey puck, if you think of a, a sports paradigm. And everyone runs to try to be able to validate. If you can validate that code, those 64 digits, and remember in, in high school when you had a combo lock and it was only three digits, you had to remember three, and just three and you still forgot. All right, I'm talking about 64 and you have to do it in seconds. So you need high performing computing power to be able to run in there you get that ball and recalibrate it. So people get pieces of a new coin. It's called a virgin coin. And it used to be at the beginning of Bitcoin, 50 Bitcoins. And every four years it has. Then it went to 2025. 
and then it went to 12 and a half. And now it's 6.25. May of 2020 was the halving. So every 10 minutes, there's a run to be able to validate a Bitcoin transaction. And, and so that's really what drives us. It's capped at 21 million coins. So you have scarcity and scarcity is very important. We've seen whenever you, we now have peak gold. Another reason for my $4,000 ounce call is that we have peak gold supply and we had peak oil and oil was at 130 until the frackers came along and they changed the supply paradigm. And then we saw oil crack. Uh, and, and but we've not seen anything happen with Bitcoin. There's no other Bitcoin around. It's only one Bitcoin. It's capped at 21 million coins. 19 have been mined. So we started also mining Ethereum. Ethereum is the Internet of Things in the blockchain. Ethereum is a smart contract, and it validates itself in seconds. Every every 20 seconds is a competition. You got to think off for that. And Ethereum is the backbone for NFTs, which people, when they want to create them, or this is the stable coin that JP Morgan launched. And that's when they stopped talking negatively about crypto when they launched their own crypto coin. And so that's the paradigm we're all re dealing with right now. I believe that the G7 countries are anti-crypto only because they're trying to come up with their own crypto coin to compete with the Chinese. And China is anti-Bitcoin because they don't want anyone to compete. And we're seeing a tectonic shift. Bitcoin mining is moving from China to North America and Scandinavia. That's what you're seeing, a huge change. But gold bullion is leaving North America and going to China. And the Chinese know the only way they can have their currency have any trust or validity behind it, it's going to have to be backed by some amount of gold. So China is the biggest mining country in the world, but they're also the biggest importer of gold. And they're doing that. So they're going to basically try to support their own cryptocurrency. Uh, and so I think these are interesting paradigm shifts we're seeing. No matter what, I believe that gold trades higher because we have peak gold supply. Uh, we also have negative real interest rates. So they're factors for it. And rising GDP per capita in China and India means more for the love trade. 60% of all gold demand is for love. And their economies continue to grow and they continue to consume gold. So I remain bullish. Crypto is the new kid on the block and crypto is going to continue to prosper. It just has six times the daily volatility of gold. Just like Tesla. Tesla is a disruptive company. It has six times the daily volatility of, of, of gold. The daily volatility of gold is only 1%. The talking heads on CNBC will tell you, oh, it's spooky, it's boogeyman stuff. Gold this century has outperformed the S&P 500 by 250%. It's outperformed Warren Buffett, who is negative on gold and negative on the airlines. So, and he's negative on Bitcoin. So I think, and he was negative on Amazon. So he's missed the new trends. Hopefully the investors can see having a 10% in gold for the past 21 years, rebalancing once a year has been a great diversify for your portfolio. I'm a big believer that crypto like Bitcoin, Ethereum have a 2% weighting is very prudent and high blockchain technology hodls. That means hold on for dear life is the acronym. We mine, we sell enough coins, Ethereum Classic to pay the electrical bills and we bank our Bitcoin and Ethereum. And so that cash and Bitcoin Ethereum is worth over a hundred million dollars in our balance sheet. Uh, and so, by owning Hive, you get a proxy. We move with the same DNA of volatility of Bitcoin, Ethereum. You don't have to go to Coinbase or some exchange to buy it and open a different account. Hive allows you to participate in that growth. So that's been our proxy because we don't have an ETF is create the creation and co-founding of Hive blockchain technology. And I'm thrilled we're gonna finally get listed on NASDAQ which means more institutions can own it and participate in it because a lot of mutual fund rules, you can't own a foreign security. It has to be listed on a recognized U.S. exchange. I think that's so exciting. Yeah, it will be on NASDAQ by the time this interview is released. It will have uh, gone up Thursday. So um, your perspective then? The ticker, the ticker is going to be HV, HV for Hive BT, Blockchain Technology. Perfect, perfect. Well, we'll put that on the screen there. And kind of your perspective on this, because a lot of people look to mining stocks when it comes to investing in precious metals to kind of give leverage to 
the movements in price. What does Hive, what advantage does Hive have as opposed to just the individual cryptocurrencies? You know, that's a great question. Um, I'll give you a classic as 2020. Hive went up, Bitcoin went up um, 325% and Ethereum went up about 500%. Hive went up 2000%. We correct the square root. I mean, we're volatile. Uh, just like even the, it was, you know, uh, Sir, Sr. John Templeton said, most people buy a stock and then they pray for it to go up. Uh, I tell people to pray before you buy it. You know, make sure that you understand this DNA of volatility so that you can handle the downdrafts like you can enjoy uh, the updrafts. Kind of being prepared for that volatility is very important. Um, well, Frank Holmes, we really appreciate your time today uh, and all the insights that you shared with us. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where people can find you online? USFunds.com is a blog. I write a Frank talk um, in, is read in 80 countries, over 100,000 subscribers around the world. Um, so I highly recommend you go to it. And we also have um, uh, our ETF. You can go to jetsetf.com and follow the airlines and goauetf.com. But just go to usfunds.com and then you can log on and see other things. And high blockchain technology. Uh, we have a great website. YouTubers love it. We provide great uh, educational content there and uh, sign up for uh, getting information on, on high. Fantastic. Once again, Frank Holmes, thank you so much for your time and God bless. And have a wonderful summer, y'all.